Okay, so welcome to the the next uh, the second session on uh, PMSM theory or brushless DC machine theory. So uh, we went through a couple of different uh, concepts related to permanent magnet synchronous machines, and I think we finally uh, came up with or stop at the rotor reference frame uh, motor model. Uh, we started with the rot uh, stator frame model which is uh, sinusoidal or, or at least your uh, parameters are varying with rotor position, right? That's the important part. The motor parameters are varying with rotor position uh, depending on the type of the machine, of, of course. But most practical machines, that is true. With rotor position, you will see the machine model change. Uh, and then if you look at the variables such as voltages and currents or flux that goes into the machine or that is in the machine, that is all that those are sinusoidal in nature. Uh, and then same theory that applies so that we discussed about the rotating MMF or the rotating flux vector is still applicable to this permanent magnet synchronous machine because we have a wound wound or three-phase wound stator, right? The only difference is we have a permanent magnet or rotor in this case. Uh, and then the voltages and currents are sinusoidal. Uh, and we were able to show that using the reference frame transformation, if you can transform into the rotor reference frame or the synchronous reference frame, uh, our model as well as the signals become much more easier to analyze the variables the current voltages became dc like uh, and then uh, the motor model we'll discuss it today in detail uh, that becomes even more simpler okay uh, so when we looked at the previous the stator reference frame model or as you would look at it uh, in in you know if you are to look at it in the normal uh, circuit diagram uh, this is what you are going to see Okay, and then we'll look at what will happen when we do the transformation to those uh, parameters. All right. Okay, so let's go into that discussion here. All right. Now, uh, last time, let's uh, we we kind of showed what VQS, VDS, and V0S. You know, the Q-axis voltages d-axis voltages and uh, the zero sequence voltages looked like uh, and we had resistances currents flux linkages all in that one equation so let's write them out previously we had them in matrix form so let's expand them out to see what we get and we can start talking about more of that okay so we said vqsr and i'm going to use simple variables here because these are uh, dynamic variables which can be varying you know with time uh, you can see transients and all that uh, r s i q s r plus l q d i q s r now we are just converting that variable p into a derivative term okay d d i q s r over d t plus omega r LD IDSR plus omega R lambda M prime R. Okay, so this is the Q axis dynamic voltage, dynamic voltage. Okay, Q axis voltage after transformation. And then if you look at the D axis voltage, VDSR, uh, we're going to see the following RS. RS, uh, S I D S R plus L D D I D S R O D T minus Omega R L Q I Q S R I Q S R. 
Okay, so this is my uh, this is my V dSR, the voltage of d axis. All right, so we have Q axis and d axis. Uh, what else? We have zero sequence V zero S R. Uh, we have here. Well, you don't need R here. Zero sequence R S I zero S plus L L S T I zero S over D T. Okay. So now when we look here, we can clearly see the back EMF term, right? Uh, prime at least due to the permanent magnet that is along VQ. Now let's go through the different elements. Okay, when we walk through, we see that we have RS IQSR plus LQ D IQSR over DT. Okay, so a resistant terms times the rate of change of current times inductance. Okay, so we have seen this before we have seen this before we came into our ac machine discussion can you guys remember can you recall where we have seen this this is very familiar at least we sh it should be very familiar to us right if we are to write this as s l q in laplace so this is a differential equation if you are to implement a motor model this is one equation these are the equations that you can use to implement your motor model in the rotor reference frame okay so this is s l q i q s r right and then this is r s i q s r in if you transform this equation to laplace domain so um, i'm not can you recall what this would this is similar to if you think of uh, so if you think of dc machines right if you think of DC machines if you can recall that we had a resistance inductance and a back EMF right for a DC mode that's what we had so we had we said this is IA we can call this VDC or VA this is RA this is LA and this is EA right very simple terms right so now if you think of along the same lines you can see here see a resistance times the current inductance times the same current and then we have some different term here we can treat them as a voltage okay uh, and that's why that's another reason we call them uh, call this a brushless dc uh, because it looks like a dc motor in the transformation now the primary difference in the synchronous uh, for the synchronous machine is instead of one equation so for a dc motor you only have one equation one differential equation here we have three equations okay and if you assume balance condition you will only need two you don't even need three equations you'll have just the two equations okay and they have again they have the same nature uh, or similar nature to the dc motor Okay, all right, and then for this type of a machine, if you to look at the torque, which is important, right? When you are building a motor model, we need to be able to uh, calculate the to output torque. Now, for a DC motor, it was KT times the current, the armature current, right? Now, for a synchronous machine, this becomes a little bit more complicated. I mean, it's in the rotor reference frame, it's fairly simple, but uh, that becomes the following so this is the number of poles poles by two okay we have to have that factor times lambda m prime r okay lambda m prime r and i'll show you how to find this variable this is associated with the back emf the permanent magnet flux linkage okay uh, lambda m prime r i q s r Q axis current, right? Q axis current plus LD minus LQ IQSR IDSR. Okay, so the product of the two currents 
times the inductance. Now, what is this LD and LQ? Let's go back to our equations here. Okay. Now, when we look at these two equations, this is the Q axis voltage equation. This is the D axis voltage equation, right? And if you look at the inductances, the D axis inductance has a different name and the Q axis inductance has a different name, LQ and LD. All right, LQ and LD. And depending on the design of the machine, LQ and LD can be the same, and LQ and LD can be different. Okay, and we talked about this when we talked about saliency, right? When we talked about saliency, uh, let me take up that very uh, straightforward example. We had a stator like this, and then we said we, we have a rotor, and we have uh, magnets. Right. We, let's think of an interior permanent magnet machine, right? So this is the rotor and we have magnets. Now, when you consider along this axis, you see different material. Therefore, your inductance is affected, right? So you will see a different inductance along this axis versus this axis, right? So that same principle applies. Uh, and if you have a surface mount magnet, Right, surface mounted permanent magnets, which is like this, right? So you're going to see a north and a south like that. So that means, regardless of which axis you consider, you are still going to see the magnet material for that surface mount, right? Therefore, your LQ and LD will be almost equal, okay, for surface mount. PMSM, your LD is almost equal to LQ. For IPM, interior permanent magnet, L LD or LQ is not equal to LD. Okay, we, we talk, just talked about that. So that's that's very important uh, piece of information to keep in mind. Now, when we go and look at our uh, torque generation, right, the induct uh, torque equation, we can see that for an for a perm uh, SMPM SM right surface mount magnet surface mount P permanent magnet synchronous machine our electromagnetic torque equation will simplify because your LD minus LQ becomes negligible this will go to zero therefore this equation becomes three over two P over two lambda m prime r iqs okay and if you look at ipm interior permanent magnet this will be valid and now what you can see here is you can even use your d axis current to generate torque Okay, now remember D axis is the direct axis that is what that's we said that is for, for a certain reason, right? We said we have a quadrature axis and a direct axis. Direct axis is going to be aligned with the flux, the, the rotor flux, right? So if you think of a think of a synchronous machine, permanent magnet synchronous machine, I'll use the blue for the stator vector. So for the stator vector, with the stator windings, you can have two axes, right? Two axes for the flux. I'll call this Q and D. We are not aligning, we are just labeling the axes, okay? If we think of the rotor, if you think of the rotor, I'll use red, for the rotor, it's going to have its own Q and D axis, right? It's going to have its own Q and D axis. Depending on the orientation of the rotor Q and D axis, right, which is determined by the magnets, right? So if your direct D axis is the direct axis along the flux, so our north on the rotor is going to be here south is there 
so you have your direct axis along the flux now when we generate flux using the stator it is based on this reference frame right so we want to orient that reference frame to be 90 degrees out of phase such that now we'll apply the state of flux along q axis quadrature axis quadrature means it's 90 degrees away from the direct axis of the rotor flux okay so that's how you will generate flux and this is going to rotate however when you generate uh, in in a uh, ipm machine you will you can even apply direct axis current which will help you generate torque because of the difference in the inductance okay um, so if, if that's a little bit too much to handle for now forget about the ipm the torque generation uh, think of the smpm SM, very simple you have an equation similar to kt times ia right kt times ia like a dc motor very simple very easy to understand uh, this can be you know maybe once you have a good understanding of this you can think about uh, the use of using the ipm machine and this uh, id current uh, now this comes down to uh, uh, the optimal torque generation or maximum torque per ampere m p p a so this is a research topic that has been studied extensively maximum torque per ampere because that's what you care about right when you generate torque in electromechanical systems you care about maximum torque per unit current now in the surface mount magnet case the only torque generation current is iq so you can basically find that relationship directly but when you have iq id and such a nonlinear relationship this becomes a little bit more complicated than the surface mount magnet case okay uh, so but this is the electromagnetic torque equation all right okay good any questions okay. so let's uh, let's try to look at our voltage equations the rotor reference frame voltage equations but from the point of a circuit so that way it will give us a little bit more uh, clarity on what's going on yes yes alex so the kt value uh, the kt value if you look at here this is only depending on the machine design machine design it is not something a control engineer or an algorithm can control for this class of machines there are you know there are new machines coming out where you can modify your lambda based on certain uh, uh, currents uh, certain mechanisms that you can use but in general if you are looking at an smp msm your uh, your your kt is going to be fixed in general okay now if you are if you have a method that we'll talk about later that you can modify lambda m you are essentially modifying kt right and we had a name for this when we talked about dc machines if you, i'm not sure if you can remember that you guys remember we we talked about a certain method to modify kt which will affect eventually influence ke right and we said with that we can op operate at uh, higher speeds we can improve or uh, do yeah so we call that field weakening control right field weakening control uh, so the same concept will apply if we can control lambda m we'll we'll, we'll get into that discussion later i don't want to jump you know jump ahead of the topic here but this is the basic idea yes the kt is in general machine dependent uh, and then you know the machine the properties the magnets the winding structure uh, the materials used all that 
gets accounted for in KT, right? Of course, over time, uh, if the magnets become weaker, the winding resistance change, you know, you don't generate as much as current. So then certain things get influenced, but uh, we're not going to go into those uh, those subtleties, at, at least for now. Okay. So let's try to uh, take a look at what these voltages look like, uh, the circuit would look like if we are to draw a circuit for the, the voltage equations. Okay, the representation, we'll call that the representation of PMSM. Yeah, SMs. Uh, this is basically the dynamic model, okay? Because we are we are dynamic model. Uh, we are modeling the differential equation, okay? Differential equation. We can talk about the steady state model too in in a little bit, okay? So first of all, so we have we talked about three differential equations, and guess what? That means we're going to have three three circuits, right? Three uh, voltage equation, differential equations, however you want to call them, but you're going to have three circuits. So first of all, we have one for VQ. You have a resistance. You have an inductance. And then you have two voltage sources, right? And we'll name them shortly. So we'll call we call this V. I'm going to use simple letters here. VQSR. We have RS. We have LQ. We have omega R. LD. IDSR. So this is due to the d-axis current. This is called cross coupling. Cross coupling because it's coupling between the axes. Okay, plus minus omega r lambda m prime r. <clears throat> okay, and then we have a current IQSR. Okay, so this is the Q axis circuit. Uh, and then we, let's look at the D axis circuit. We're going to have a similar circuit. Okay, inductance. Then we have just the cross coupling term, no back EMF. Right. So VDSR, RS, LD, because this is D axis. Right? Look at the polarity omega R, LQ, IDSR. Okay. And then we have a current IDSR. Now, Actually, this is a good point where we can think about a little bit about the field weakening. Now, see here, IDSR is the current going through this circuit, right? The VD voltage equation. Now, by controlling the VDS voltage, we can essentially control the ID current, right? We can control the ID current. Now, if you look at this equation here, we can, by changing the current here, we can influence our VQ circuit voltage, which is technically responsible for the torque generation, IQ, right? So, which is telling us that, you know, hey, if you need to go to high speed, or some kind of field weakening that you want to achieve, you can do that by controlling the VD voltage. So this cross coupling is helpful. Okay, and there are control algorithms that control algorithms that get rid of this cross coupling too. Okay, and uh, forget the term. Uh, Deke, I think it's called a cross axis decoupling control. So they kind of mitigate the coupling through control strategies. Uh, if, we, if we have time, we can talk about that too. Okay. All right. 
Okay. Uh, but do you see that relationship? So let's say we have uh, a negative ID here, right? If you have a negative ID current, that means this is essentially going to flip in polarity. And now you have more voltage on this circuit, right? So you have VQ voltage plus a little bit more coming from the VQ, uh, v, VD axis that can help uh, the, the torque generation or if you want to go to a higher speed. Okay, you can go to a higher speed because now you can control that voltage. Okay, all right. And then let's look at the zero sequence here. Uh, we have just a resistor and we have the leakage term here. Okay, so we have V0S and RS, V0S, and then this is our leakage term. Okay, so we were able to break down that three phase winding representation into this DC motor like circuit diagrams, which will, you know, which will simplify our analysis. And the, the voltages VQVD and IQID, those are DC like voltages in steady state and they're no longer sinusoidal all because of the rotor reference frame transformation okay all right so let's see what else we can talk about now uh, we know that we have uh, omega r right we have our motor speed omega r uh, omega r is the rotor speed and then this is basically the rate of change of theta r the rotor okay uh, and then we need to apply voltage to drive this three phase motor right and we can measure current later but we have to apply voltage to drive it. So let's say we apply a three-phase set of voltage, ABC. Okay. So if uh, our applied voltages are sinusoidal, sinusoidal, then you know we AS it's going to be, uh, I'm going to say Vs. Now, Vs cosine theta Ev. Okay. Theta Ev is, uh, is actually theta Ev can be written in the following way. Vs cosine omega E v key plus let's say phi prime okay now the importance here is we have a frequency for our voltage so this is essentially this is going to be our synchronous frequency right uh, because this is a synchronous machine and we can now introduce a phase into our voltage which we can control when we apply our voltages we can decide to apply it in phase with our back emf or out of phase with our back emf and when we say out of phase it can be any phase angle or at any phase shift there is an optimal angle that we'll talk about later but just we need to have the concept that we can control how we apply our phase voltages to the machine okay so this is a little uh, this is a generic res representation now we, if if we are applying vas like that to to be balanced our vbs vs is going uh, vbs will have the same amplitude right then cosine theta ev minus 2 pi over 3 and then VCS, same amplitude, cosine theta EV minus 4 pi over 3. 4 pi over 3. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. All right. 
So we have that. Now, what will happen if we transform these to rotor reference frame using, you, you know, like a position measurement, right? We are we are accurately measuring the 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 position of this or the theta ev is being accurately measured, right? If we can do that, uh, what we can do is we can we can determine what these voltages would transform into when we uh, look at them from the rotor reference frame. Okay, so any thoughts? What will they look like once we transform them? So if we do, if we perform a rotor reference frame transformation, rotor reference frame transformation, we will see that we have the QSR, which is equal to Vs cosine. Uh, if we do, if we align with it, we are going to have what V. What did we write it as? V. We're going to have, let's call this V, v. okay? And then we're going to have VDSR, VS, uh, let me see, I think it was negative, right? Sine V, V. And then what is phi v, right? This is the angle, the phi v is basically the angle between theta ev and theta r. So if there is a difference between the rotor angle or rotor position and the applied voltage angle, that will introduce the phase shift. You now once you transform, it becomes a magnitude, right? So it'll, it'll, it'll be a factor that will apply to VQ and VD. So basically, if you are to think of, let's say, Vs is 10, right? Let's say Vs is 10 volts. So for your sinusoid, right, 10 volts. And then depending on how you choose the phase shift to, phase shift to be, uh, for example, if it was 45, right? If, if this value, Vv was 45 degrees, then what is cosine PV? That's cosine 45. Cosine 45. Cosine 45. What's cosine 45? Cosine 45. 1 over 2? What if this was 60? What if this what if this was 60? Cos what's cosine 60? Half, right? Cosine 60. So this is VQ is going to be 10 times half. And then VDSR, this is going to be negative 10 times, but sine 60. root 3 over 2, right? So now you can see that how the uh, the voltage will split between Q and D axis depending on how much offset you introduce to that voltage. This is called that voltage angle. Okay, This is going to come up again when we talk about field-oriented control, which is very useful. Okay, uh, so Let's just keep that in mind. And then uh, omega E is our electrical frequency. Uh, we can say that this is theta EV over dt. Okay, 
Okay, so this is our electrical frequency. Electrical frequency. All right. Now, if you introduce such an offset, of course, you're going to apply voltage to Q axis as well as D axis. But if you properly align, you can uh, apply all the voltage to Q and no voltage to D. Okay. Uh, so, so you have the ability to control how you apply the voltage uh, to the machine. Okay. So uh, previously, we talked about the dynamic model right we looked at the dynamic model of a pm permanent magnet synchronous machine which had differential terms okay uh, but oftentimes you don't need the full dynamic model to analyze machines you can basically use a steady state model okay steady state steady state model okay and we are assuming a balanced machine balance machine here yeah. if there are imbalances you know the model is going to get a little bit more complicated and and it, that depends on the imbalance too sometimes it gets a little bit you know, not little bit but a lot complicated uh, now i'm going to use capital letters here vqsr is equal to rs iqsr your LQ inductance disappears. We are considering steady state, right? Steady state plus omega R LD IDSR plus omega R lambda M prime R. Okay, and then VDSR becomes RS IDSR minus omega R. LQ, LQSR. Okay, uh, so very nice, very straightforward equation, uh, and the generic torque equation it doesn't change whether you are looking at the dynamic model or the steady state model. Three over two, V over two, but I'll write it a little bit differently here. Let me take IQSR outside, so then you're gonna get lambda m prime r plus ld minus lq i dsr times iqsr okay so this is your steady state motor model now this is much more easier to implement than if you are to implement that three phase model Okay, which is still possible. You know, if, if I have time, I might uh, record how to develop a, a, a state of frame model in MATLAB in Simulink maybe later. But, you know, you can uh, develop either one and they're going to perform all, all the same, at least for the balance case. In balance case, you have to be a little bit more careful. Okay. Good. Any questions? Okay, good. So we have the models now, right? Now, when you get a machine, we need to be able to, uh, you know, characterize the machine. That's the other important topic that you have to think about. Characterization of a permanent magnet synchronous machines. Okay, have you had, uh, have you had to, characterize oh, a machine you know for for a project that you've been working on so uh, do you recall how we characterized uh, dc motors dc motors how to characterize a dc motor how do we characterize a DC motor. Hmm. How do we characterize a DC motor? Uh, 
Uh, not necessarily. Characterization. Uh, characterization. Well, there are no poles. At least we don't consider that for DC motors, right? Characterization of PMS permanent magnet synchronous machine. How? What are the parameters of interest for a DC motor? You guys recall? So if you can remember, for a DC motor, we had the in resistance, right? The winding resistance that we looked at, right? And similarly, here we are going to have our phase, the phase resistance. Uh, and then we're going to have inductance, right? In this case, we're going to have LQ and LD, two inductance values. And then we're going to have our back EMF constant, right? Lambda M prime R, right? Back EMF constant. Uh, and then one more thing, we, sh we shouldn't forget number of poles. But not a lot of people talk about this, but uh, number of poles are also an important, uh, especially when you try to align uh, with, you know, your position sensor, you need to know how many poles you have. Uh, for your calculation to divide your uh, mechanical position okay so how do we find the number of poles how do we find number of poles so uh, p this is poles right number of poles uh, it's straightforward, uh, I mean, relatively straightforward, and there are a couple of different approaches you can follow. Uh, if you have a position sensor attached that you can take a measurement from, that will be ideal, but it's not very practical. In most cases, you might not have the position sensor attached, or you might need to power the position sensor to take measurements. So, so that way, it might not be that practical. But Typically, uh, I'm trying to think what I would do is uh, try to rotate the motor, right? So if you think of the motor poles, let's take a very simple rotor here, okay? Uh, and we have, let's say we have uh, four or two, two pole pairs or four poles. Right, so you have a north, south, north, south, right there. Okay, so this is the rotor, the rotor only, right? And what you can do is you can spin this motor shaft with with a with some device, a DC motor maybe, or you can use a drill, a power tool. Uh, you have to, you know, uh, take good care when you use a power tool like that, you know. Uh, but spin it relatively slow but not very slow because what we're trying to do is we are trying to look at the back EMF. Okay, we are trying to look at the back EMF that this rotor generates so you you can't have the windings connect to anything you have to have them open right? all the windings are open and you can measure the face-to-face -face voltage while you spin this motor very slowly, okay? And the reason we spin it very slowly is because we want to know, we need to know one revolution, okay, one revolution. How many, so if you spin it slow enough and if you have a, a way of marking the rotor, right, somehow, you can put a piece of tape or something like that, uh, you can know that when this goes through one revolution. And when it goes through one revolution, if you have two pole pairs, how many electrical cycles, how many volts? Oh, wait. What happened? Can you see 
Alex, can you guys see? Garrett, Garrett, are you there? Yeah, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear, but um, did you have the same issue? Did it drop out? Yeah, it's good now. At, at what point did you did I lose you? Uh, you were talking about the phase voltages a little. OK, so how to measure the back EMF? Uh, yep. How to? Yep. OK. Uh, Alex, can you hear me? Yeah, OK, good. Uh, where did I lose you? You were saying something about that they uh, these two lines that you're pointing at right here had to be open for a OK, so OK. That's what the last thing I was hearing. OK, so these are the phases, right, ABC phases. And you have to have them open because we are going to look at the phase to phase back EMF. OK, so if you want to visualize this based on our uh, little circuit diagram, right? So you're going to have inductance, resistance, source, inductance, resistance. So basically, we are looking at, so if this is A and B and C, we are looking at B and C, this voltage while it's not connected to any device and you are basically measuring this back emf okay. back emf is going to have the influence of poles because your magnets are going to cut through the windings and the number of back emf cycles per revolution will give you a way to find how many poles you have Okay, so that's why we uh, that's uh, one way we can find the number of poles. So if you spin the motor this way, uh, and then if you record for one revolution, if you don't have a sensor, you have to come up with a method to find that one revolution. Uh, you'll see that for one revolution for this motor, you're going to see two cycles. Right, you're going to see two cycles because you're going to see a north, a south, a north, a south, peak, a valley, a peak, a valley, right? Uh, so depend. So first of all, record that, count the number of cycles per one mechanical revolution, one mechanical revolution, right? And that's the number of pole pairs you have. If you want to know the poles, it's basically, you know, how many peaks and valleys. So we have one, two, three, four peaks and valleys. That means this is a four pole motor, four pole motor or two pole pairs, two pole pairs. OK, so this is how you would find the number of poles in a permanent magnet synchronous machine. OK. Good. All right. Uh, so we have to talk about three things next. We have to talk about flux linkage and the inductance. OK, uh, I want to hold off because I don't want to stop in the middle. We have about 10 minutes. And what we can do is we can talk about the rest of the characterization process next time. OK. Good. So do you guys have any?